Previously, we've been examining Mendel's theories of inheritance, but recall Mendel had no idea about chromosomes, genes, or DNA, and he termed these things factors. So in this lecture, we will explore chromosome theory, how we understood the existence of chromosomes, as well as sex linkage. By the end of the lecture, you should be able to explain the chromosomal theory of inheritance as well as describe the nature of sex linkage and discuss how chromosomes are linked to sex determination as well as evaluate the impact of X inactivation and explain exceptions to chromosomal theory of inheritance. So let's begin by taking a look at the chromosomal theory of inheritance. Basically, it says, before we get into the background, that uh, chromosomes are the basis of all genetic inheritance. So genes are located on chromosomes, in short. So how did we come to this explanation? Well, it was about 100 years beyond Mendel's description of factors that Sutton and Boveri independently researched chromosomes and their movement during meiosis. They were looking at sea urchins and uh, grasshoppers, and they noticed that chromosomes were necessary for an embryo to grow. If they removed them, it didn't work. And that you could actually observe those chromosomes pairing and shuffling on the metaphase plate. So there is evidence then, physical evidence, of chromosomes segregating and independent assortment, each set of chromosomes assorting independently of other sets. So there's the visual evidence linking Mendel's factors to chromosomes. So the next piece of the puzzle is to determine that this is really what's going on. So it was a little bit sketchy in the beginning. People really didn't believe that that's what had happened. It took about 10 years for the idea to sink in. And it was culminated with the, uh, the findings of Thomas Hunt Morgan. Thomas Hunt Morgan was doing work with fruit flies. You're probably familiar with the name at some level. And what he noticed or what he was looking at was red eye color. And he found some flies that had white eye color. And when he performed a cross between a white-eyed male and a red-eyed female, he found that the F1 progeny all had red eyes, and that's great. We've seen simple dominance like that. But when he crossed the F1 progeny, we ended up with only males with white eyes. And so Thomas Hunt Morgan thought, well, perhaps then white eyes in females is a lethal condition. So they were non-viable, unable to reproduce. And to answer this question, he performed a test cross. In the test cross, he took the F1 generation female, the heterozygote female, and test cross back to the recessive condition, the male with white eyes. So because the outcomes of the test cross revealed that the white-eyed females are actually viable, Thomas Hunt Morgan suggested that the trait must be associated with sex determination somehow and showed that possibly there is an X and Y chromosome involved in sex determination and confirmed this chromosomal theory of inheritance. So sex determination in humans, you're probably all fairly familiar with. The female has a possibility of contributing X and X, and the male could contribute an X or a Y. And the Y chromosome is a little bit special. First of all, it's tiny, but it also has a gene on it that is involved in sex determination. It's called the SRY region of the Y chromosome. So it's the sex determining region of the Y chromosome. And if that gene is present and expressed, then we will see maleness. But if that gene is not present, maybe there's no Y chromosome, or maybe the gene is broken, then by default, we will see the female phenotype in the human condition. So we know how this works out. We have an X and a Y. We can have a male progeny or X's and X's, we have female progeny. So it's a 50% chance of boys or girls based on this sex determining system. So that brings us to a little bit of a question. 
um, in thinking about things that are linked on the X chromosome. We call them X-linked traits or sex-linked traits. You're probably familiar with at least one of these being color blindness. We know color blindness is much more frequent in males, this red-green color blindness at least, in males than in females. And in general, when you see something that's more common as a phenotype in males, it is probably X-linked or sex-linked. So why do we see this skewed ratio that colorblindness is more frequent in males? Um, it's an X-linked recessive case. In this example, we are crossing a carrier female. The female has the allele for colorblindness, the recessive B, and she can pass that on to her sons, but not her daughters. In this case, if the father had actual color blindness, then there's a potential for the daughter to have color blindness. But because the male only has one X, if they get the allele, then they are colorblind. There's no possibility of covering it up. Another condition that you may be f uh, familiar with is hemophilia. Hemophilia occurs when blood doesn't clot properly, and so someone who has hemophilia will uh, if they get cut, they could bleed out. Now we can actually take some clotting factors to make sure that the blood clots properly. Um, and so it's not as big of an issue as it has been historically. But hemophilia has been very well mapped throughout the European royal families. Um, you've probably heard of that before too. The point here though is if we have a carrier female and an affected male, you can see how a homozygous recessive form would end up in a female having hemophilia, but that would mean that the mother has to be a carrier and the father actually has to have hemophilia in order to produce that homozygous recessive phenotype in the, or genotype in the female. Whereas in males, it's pretty easy to pick up. Again, only one copy is necessary. So what does it look like if we have a X-linked dominant situation? Well, you don't see quite the same thing. Most of them seem to be recessive, but if we had X-linked dominance, like we see in um, the condition that causes brown teeth, which is amylogenesis imperfecta, um, people's teeth are browning, they're not making one of the correct uh, components of tooth enamel, you can see that if the affected female, she could be heterozygous or homozygous, but most likely she would be heterozygous. She's affected, she has browning teeth, and if you cross that individual with an unaffected male, then you would find that you have about 50-50 between males and females. So you don't see the same um, impact of mostly males being affected. Again, most of these X-linked traits are going to be homozygous recessive type traits or recessive alleles. So we're dealing with this X, Y sex linked business. We know that the Y chromosome is teeny tiny and the X chromosome is much larger, contains a lot more information. We can ask this question as I do all of my classes. Do women just have too much stuff on the X chromosome? Is there too much baggage or do men just not really have enough? So it's a neat question because in truth, what we're going to see is there's a dosage compensation that takes place in order for us to have an equal amount of information. But the differences could explain some of the um, changes we see between males and females, right? Um, the calico cat is a great example of a genetic mosaic, which is what results from dosage compensation. Basically, one of the X's is going to become inactivated. There are two genes involved in color in the calico cat, so it's some sort of epistatic thing, again, where we have a pathway, um, bio, um, biochemical pathway in order to produce color. And we have either the allele uh, for no pigment, right, which would get in the way of expression of pigment, or we could have a black fur, orange fur allele. In the areas where the black fur and orange fur allele are expressed, we will see an example of X inactivation. 
So in X inactivation, what happens? This is only going to happen in females because we have two X chromosomes. And with two X chromosomes in every single cell, one of those X chromosomes will become bound up. So the one that becomes bound up is called a bar body. And the other one that's expressed will maintain, and that gene is accessible to all the machinery of the cell to be expressed as orange in this case. And the bar body is not accessible for expression. So the X chromosome on the allele for black fur could be the one that's active, and the orange one could be inactivated in which case you would have production of black fur from all of the cells resulting from mitosis of that original cell where the bar body was created. So that result um, is, or that's what brings us to the calico cat. We have an area where the black is inactivated and the orange maintains itself actively. We have the orange fur and Contrarily, if the black one is activated and the orange inactivated, we end up with black fur. So pretty neat genetic mosaic. Another example of where we'll see genetic mosaics in females, we tend to, if we um, have two options of sweat gland expression and not sweat gland expression, you can see mosaics of patches of skin that sweat versus patches of skin that don't, whereas males will have expression of the one X chromosome and sweating all over the skin. So again, females could have mosaics in the sweating patterns, but if they are homozygous, um, you don't have that issue at all. So genetic mosaics result from dosage compensation and X inactivation. Pretty cool system. So no, not all traits are going to be located on chromosomes that are in the nucleus. So this is where we're going to look at exceptions to the chromosomal theory of inheritance because these things are not going to exhibit Mendelian, Mendelian style inheritance patterns. Example here, first of all, is looking at mitochondria. We know that mitochondria contain their own DNA. And when we have a sperm fertilize an egg, clearly the sperm doesn't have room for much cytoplasm. And so the egg is the contributor of all the cytoplasm and thus all of the mitochondria and thus all of the mitochondrial DNA. We've identified that there are a number of genes on the mitochondrial chromosomes that end up uh, being expressed. And we can trace this maternal inheritance through multiple generations to uh, identify relationships between individuals. So mitochondrial DNA has to follow uh, a female lineage. And the other place that we will see exceptions to chromosomal theory is in the blossoming field of epigenetics. Epigenetic factors are any factors that influence gene expression that are epi above the genome, right? So we have the DNA sequence, we have all the genes on our nuclear DNA. But as you'll learn later on, there are many regions of our uh, genome that are not expressed as genes, so they don't code for proteins. However, uh, we now know that these regions we used to call junk DNA have a lot of impact on the expression of genes, and in the environment has a large impact on these epigenetic factors. So first of all, we'll look at um, a couple of different mechanisms in which DNA packing is uh, impacting whether genes can be expressed, and as well as that DNA methylation, which affects somewhat how the genes pack. But also we can see that there are dietary impacts. The kind of stuff we're consuming can actually impact how genes are expressed, which is kind of revolutionary. This is new stuff. And then we can also see that the environment impacts it. If we're in, exposed to lots of teratogens or very high levels of stress, the environment can certainly cause uh, changes to the epigenome and affect gene expression. And later on in this series, you will 
uh, learn all about transposable elements. Jumping genes, they can go from one place to the other in the genome and impact gene expression. So these are all epigenetic factors. Also, multiple parts of the genome are involved in regulating gene expression. One example we'll see here is uh, small RNA sequences that interact with DNA as it packs. So really cool stuff in epigenetics because this is where we're seeing uh, nature or nurture. It's not really a question anymore of nature or nurture. It's an impact of where nature is sort of uh, being impacted by the nurture, what we experience during life. So let's look at some of the DNA packing questions that are epigenetic factors. You recall that DNA has uh, is all unwound in order to have access to the genes. The machinery of the cell needs it unwound so that it can translate and transcribe and make the appropriate proteins. And we know that DNA packs into chromosomes using a sequence of coiling and folding and supercoiling, and eventually we pack into a chromosome. And that uh, chromosome packing can impact, uh, they don't always uh, uncoil all the way, I guess is what I'm saying. So you can have euchromatin, which is available to be transcribed and translated. That would be the very unwound or loosely wound form of DNA. And heterochromatin, which is more tightly packed. Now, clearly, if the chromosome is very tightly packed and everything is wound up, then we don't have access to the DNA. And if we're not going to transcribe genes in that region of the DNA, why? I unravel it all during cell, uh, you know, G1 and S and G2. We don't need to unravel everything all the time, just the sections that need to be expressed. So whether there's heterochromatin or euchromatin will determine whether genes can be expressed. That's the very basic level of gene packing. Now, if we do unwind the DNA most of the way, you'll recall that the DNA is wound about two and a quarter times around a histone core, and there are tails on these histone proteins that sort of hold on to the DNA around their waist like it's a belt. So they're sort of belt loops, I guess. And those histone tails can become acetylated, and that acetylation or modification to the histone tails causes them to grip onto the DNA more tightly, and thus not give access to the uh, transcriptional mechanisms in the nucleus to uh, that DNA. Even if DNA is very unwound in the euchromatin form, and theoretically there would be access to that DNA so that we could transcribe and translate it and make the necessary proteins, DNA methylation is another mechanism that can prevent uh, those transcription factors from binding onto the DNA. Methylation involves adding methyl groups to cytosine residues along the DNA strand, and it binds essentially into the major groove and prevents uh, the transcription factors from binding. In another lecture, you'll learn that the genome contains all sorts of non-coding stuff that ends up in the production of RNA. Some of these RNAs are involved as epigenetic factors in also preventing access to the DNA. So these RNAs will be transcribed into RNAs but never translated into proteins, and they interact with the DNA in a way to kind of keep it coiled, keep it all locked up. Finally, I introduced the idea that environment impacts these epigenetic factors and can change the DNA. Not only that, but we're learning that these changes to DNA could be heritable. So in this lecture, we've explored a number of different ideas about chromosomes and chromosome theory, sex linkage, and epigenetics, factors that are not in the chromosomes themselves. So by now, you should be able to explain the chromosomal theory of inheritance and describe the nature of sex linkage, as well as discuss how chromosomes are involved in determining sex. Also, you should be able to evaluate the impact of X inactivation and explain exceptions to chromosomal theory. Thanks so much for listening.